Uh, today we're going to talk about um, my photography at the Winter Olympics uh, in Pyeongchang in Korea. And I put together a slide, all new slides here with images and I'm going to tell you some stories of what it was like to share that experience. Uh, it's, um, it's always, every, every Olympics is different. I was just having lunch with some of the people here from B&H and they were asking me, what do you like better, summer or winter Olympics and which are your favorite? And everyone's unique. And so this one was definitely unique in many respects, uh, both in photos and in stories. So with that, I will take you through it. So um, I should mention, let me go back for a second, that this pre presentation is sponsored by Canon. Uh, I'm a Canon photographer and have been for my entire professional career. I rely on, uh, on all Canon cameras and lenses, uh, and very happily, I should mention. Um, I thank them because, honestly, if it wasn't for them, then I wouldn't be able to be here. So thank you to Canon for that. All right. Um, this is my sixth Olympic Games I just completed. Started in Beijing in 08, and then went off to Vancouver, did my first Winter Olympics, uh, shooting for USA Hockey, who I still shoot for at the Winter Games. Uh, then I went to London and shot, uh, for, again, for Team USA, mostly USA water polo, then did Sochi, uh, then Rio, and then uh, Pyeongchang. What was interesting about this Winter Olympics, it was the first Winter Olympics that was winter. Um, both in uh, Vancouver and in Sochi, it was about 50 or 60 degrees. So it was great, really comfortable. I'm from San Francisco, that's like summer weather for us. So it was really nice to be able to just kind of go in jeans and go out and shoot and not have to worry about it. There were a couple of cold days in Vancouver, but in Sochi, there really weren't. And so this was the first Olympics that kind of scared me a little bit because I'm from California, we're not used to cold weather. I didn't own clothes for this kind of Olympics, so I had to go out and buy all new jackets and things, and it was cold. Opening ceremonies was about five degrees. Um, and, and we're there for you know four, five hours in place. So it was a bit uh, challenging, and I'll talk about that as we go through. But that's um, neither here nor there. This is my gear. Uh, every Olympics is different on what I take. Um, what you'll notice in this shot, I had two 1DX Mark IIs. I had uh, a Canon 5D Mark IV, and the reason I brought the Mark IV with me is that I knew that there were certain times I'd want to take a smaller camera body if I'm walking around town, or I actually did a tour of like the DMZ. It was nice to have a smaller camera body with me, so I took the uh, 5D Mark IV with me. Uh, I had two 1DXs, actually, which I didn't have to take with me. They're in this photo, but um, actually Canon was nice enough to have that ready for me there at the Olympics which is great because I didn't have to travel with all that. You'll also notice that there's no really long lenses. There's a 70 to 200 and a 100 to 400, which I lived on, uh, and nothing bigger. And the reason is the 200 to 400, which is my favorite long lens, again, Canon had waiting for me at the Olympics. Um, for lenses, 2470, 1635, I did have a fisheye, the 8 to 15 fisheye, which I used for uh, shots on the glass during hockey, which you'll see as we cruise through here in the presentation. I brought one flash. Never used it. So for one, they're not allowed in any Olympic uh, games. But I sometimes would use it I, if I'm doing things in the media zone. The lighting was similar to here where there's uh, video lights for TV. I didn't even need it. So I brought it with me and uh, I carried it with me every day. And I don't think I ever pulled it out once. Uh, pocket wizards for doing uh, remote shooting. Uh, you'll notice a uh, in the center a little hood, a little rubber lens hood. Uh, which I'll talk about a little later. That was kind of cool to have. Monopods from Gitzo and Tripod, which I use for night shots. Um, those monopods are absolutely uh, indispensable at the Olympic Games because you really don't want to handhold a, a 200 to 400 for very long because your back will scream at you. I do use a MacBook Pro, same one I've got here. Uh, lots of memory cards. And uh, I, did, I, did, I actually used a Black Rapid strap a lot at the Games. That was kind of my go-to gear. And I'll talk, talk a little bit more about that as we're cruising through. This is the Canon 200 to 400 that I was borrowing from the Olympics, or from Canon at the games. And um, you notice that the monopod is attached because again, I don't like to handhold this if I, don't, if I can avoid it. Um, it's a pretty heavy lens, but it's awesome. What I love about it, it goes from 200 to 400. If I need to go farther, I just flip the built-in teleconverter and I go all the way to 560 millimeters with the same lens. A lot of people talk about primes. I actually am not a prime fan. I love zooms. I like the ability to reframe and go in tight, come back wide, and you'll see that in the shots that, that are coming up, that that's kind of what I would go for. 
Um, I did use this lens sporadically. I use it more in the Summer Olympics than I do in the Winter Olympics. Uh, this was actually taken in one of the media tents. What's interesting about the Olympics, each year it gets more and more transportable. And so what they're trying to do to save cost and make it easy to set up for the next Olympic Games is that they build a lot of tents and things like that that are temporary structures. So they're not having to build, uh, spend you know millions of dollars building hard structures. So they set these up, we work in those, they tear them down right after the Paralympics are over. This one, we had a couple of windstorms. This one we got evacuated soon after this picture was taken because literally the tent was, they thought it might just blow over. Kind of interesting. All right. My gear of choice. So this is the gear that I pretty much lived on there. As I mentioned, I use the Canon 1DX Mark IIs 90% of the time. And the reason is because they can take 14 frames a second, which is critical if you're shooting sports and you want to get a peak of action, having that frame rate really, really helps. Um, and it's not always that I'm shooting at 14 frames a second, but if I'm shooting things like hockey, it definitely helps to do that. Um, lenses that I use the most were really the 70 to 200. That's what I'm using on the glass for hockey, along with the fisheye. Um, I'd use the wide every, uh, every time I'm shooting in the media, uh, what we call the mix zone. So after each Olympic sport, as the athletes would finish, they go through the media interview area, which we call the mix zone, and I can photograph them there, and I'll typically use like a 2470 there. So this is kind of the, the kit I would have with me. Um, I had a large set uh, that you saw that picture of with everything in my uh, apartment. And then each day, knowing what I was gonna shoot, I would then grab a subset of that and take it with me. So um, this was me uh, before the Olympics, uh, right by uh, the stadium for opening ceremonies. And there were certain challenges. Every Olympics has its own challenge. And this one was really, um, the time zone, obviously it's very far, it wasn't like Vancouver, where I, could, I was in the same time zone as California, an hour and a half flight. It was about a 12 hour flight plus a uh, three hour train ride on a bullet train to get to Pyeongchang. So it was a, it was a haul just to get there. And then because of the fact that um, we were there and NBC wanted things to be live, a lot of the events were early in the morning and then late in the evening and not much in the, in the middle of the day. So it really meant that we were working, typically my day was about eight in the morning till about two or three in the morning every day for three weeks. So that made it tough. The other thing was the locations, very different than past Olympics. In Sochi, if I wanted to go from the men's Olympic, uh, the, the, the larger Olympic uh, venue to the smaller hockey venue, literally it was about a 200 foot walk. Here, they're about three miles away, but there was no direct bus that went from one to the other. So I had to go back to the, uh, the media village and then transfer. So it's about an hour and 20 minutes. So it was really difficult. Everything was like an hour bus ride. Um, and so, and I never once got up to skiing or snowboarding because I was a two hour bus ride each way if you caught it exactly right, which means you had a lot for about three hours each way. So it was really tough. Uh, as I mentioned, the schedule at every Olympics is nuts because uh, for me, I'm shooting for the team, I'm shooting and blogging, so I'm blogging every day and that takes a couple hours. Um, and there's really no downtime. So when I'm on a press bus, I'm, I'm editing or writing on the blog. Um, if there wasn't internet on the bus, I would just tether to my phone and, and work off the internet that way. But there's really no downtime at all for, for the Olympics at all. And as I mentioned, the biggest challenge for me at this one was cold weather. Um, and it was literally going from five degrees, then you get on the press bus, it'd be like 99 degrees. I don't know what they were thinking. Like they heat these things so much. So you're taking everything off. Well, not everything. Uh, that'd be bad. Uh, taking a lot of stuff off, and that would be scary. And then, uh, and then, of course, you'd get off the bus an hour later, and then you'd have to put everything right back on again because you'd be freezing. And it was back and forth. The, the media room that we worked at at the main press center literally was so hot I couldn't even work in there. And I said, like, were you guys trying to make a sauna out of this? It was really strange. So I could never work in the main uh, press room at the main press center. All right. So here's the way it went. So day one. Uh, I landed after doing this 12 hour flight, three hour train ride, got to the apartment, uh, got to sleep, and I woke up the next morning at like, you know, whatever, three in the morning, whatever it was. I went down to get something for breakfast early in the morning, and uh, just as a total fluke, I ran into my contacts from Team USA, USA Hockey, and they said, oh, Jeff, you're here. We didn't think you were coming until later. I said, no, I'm here. And they go, oh, good, because the team, uh, team picture for the, the ladies hockey team is an hour and a half. 
now knowing that everything was gonna take a while to get there, I was like, oh boy. So I jammed up to my apartment, got whatever gear I could grab quickly, and headed out, and we made it just in time to get the shots. So the first thing I did, literally, basically off getting into the Olympic Village was shooting the team picture. And so um, I have access to get on the ice and I'm shooting directly on the ice to get the shot, which is fun. And we don't just do the team picture, we're actually doing other subsets. So it might be you know, all the girls from Minnesota, all the, all the ladies from Michigan, all the people who are you know, uh, different areas or whatever. And so I'm trying to cover all of those and they're calling those out. Okay, everybody from Michigan, come on in. And then they'll come in and group up and I'll get the shot. And so I'm in charge of getting all that for the team. Uh, and posting it to them. But I also looking for other cool stuff. So even though this is like the pose shot that they're looking for, I turned around and actually, if you look at all the chairs they're sitting on, they were pushing each other around on the chairs on the ice because they're all having fun. And so I looked around and I saw Hillary Knight doing this uh, selfie and I just, I had a 70 to 200. I used back button focus on my camera. So I used back button on her face, lifted the camera up and shot and got that. And that's one of my favorite shots because it really shows who they are, not just a posed picture. Then it got to opening ceremonies. And again, the opening was really cold, but uh, always yields fun photos for us. So um, this, I did use the 200 to 400 because I wanted the reach to be able to flip that switch and go into 560 millimeters, which I did here. So even though it's on a giant you know, platform or stage, I'm looking at what's on the stage to try to key in on interesting uh, photos and moments like this. Or like this one here, where the, the light was specific to the uh, figure in the middle, great colors that are the kids are dressed in, of course, because it's for television, so they have great colors. But I like the way it went dark all the way around it. So I'm looking at that saying, that's a cool shot, zoom me in and get in. Now, one of the things that I do, uh, and you'll see a lot of this in the presentation, a lot of motion blur uh, and, and slowing the camera shutter down to be more creative. So here, what I did is I saw this woman in the middle and she was staying very still. So I thought, well, there's a chance to actually get some motion around her. So I'm slowing the shutter speed down to about maybe 60th of a second so that all the dances around her are showing movement. And luckily her and the kids were still enough at that point that they were kind of frozen. Now, why do I do that? The Winter Olympics, there's about a thousand photographers. Summer Olympics, there's about 2,000 photographers. So I'm trying to be different because we're all sitting in similar locations to get the same kinds of shots. So how do I be different? So that's one of the reasons I slow it down like that. So this is a shot as shooting for Team USA I've got to get. Um, I almost missed this. I have to admit uh, I made a mistake. So I'm thinking United States would be you toward the very end. So I'm just you know sitting there and not paying attention. And I forget that they go by the letter of the country that they're in. And in Korea, United States actually isn't with a U or whatever. It came, they were like probably the 12th team out or something. So I'm sitting there, I'm looking down at something and the guy next to me from Europe nudges me and go, this is your team, yeah? I'm like, oh God, <laughs> like quickly trying to get the shot. Um, so sometimes uh, you have to just wing it. So, and I'm by far, from being perfect in any stretch of the imagination. So, but I got it, I was happy to get the shot. Um, this is a shot you wanna get, which is the lighting of the Olympic flame that was directly across from me. So when I'm uh, getting, so at the Olympics to get, uh, go to opening ceremonies, you have to actually get a ticket in because there's so many people who want to go, so many photographers, they don't have enough spaces for all of them. So I got a ticket and they said, where do you want to sit? And I chose to sit directly across from the flame so I could get a shot like this. Now, I do carry two cameras with me for uh, opening and closing ceremonies. I have the, the 1DX Mark II with a uh, long lens, the 200 to 400, but I also carry another camera, in this case, I think it was the 5D Mark IV, with the, um, I thought I was gonna use a 16 to 35. Luckily, I brought my 2470. I actually like the 2470 better for this. So what I did is I mounted that on the 5D Mark IV. I had it right next to me on my bench. So as I was shooting, once the fireworks would go off, I had already pre focused on the stands in the background. So the camera was already pre-focused there. And what I did was I generally will turn the camera down one full stop. I'm an aperture priority and I'll go down a full stop to protect my highlights because I can always brighten things a little bit later. I don't want to blow them out. So what I'm trying to do is protect that Olympic flame that you see on the side. I don't want that to be overexposed because, or nor the fireworks. I want the colors of the fireworks. So I'm down 
one full stop to protect those highlights and firing off my shots. And so as I mentioned, it's, it's pre-focused, but, and so it's kind of ready to go. So I'm shooting with the monopod and the big lens and also on the fireworks go off, I kind of cradle that in one arm, I reach down, I grab the other camera and I start firing just blindly almost. And then, um, so the responsibilities uh, of being the photographer for, for, team, for USA Hockey in this case is, as I mentioned, the team pictures on the ice. Anytime they have any kind of press conference, I need to be there, so I'm required to be there. And this was the press conference for the ladies, um, and I did multiple shots. I did shots of them being interviewed, and then at the end of the interview, I got them all grouped up for this shot. I had just the athletes, and then we got all the coaches and support people into it, the shot that you see here. Now the cool thing about this particular media um, center and these rooms is they're really well lit and they have the Olympic colors, so we always sneak shots of ourselves there. Um, this is actually my Facebook banner across the top. And it's kind of fun to get those, so whenever someone's not in one of these interview areas and we happen to be there, we'll, we'll sneak in and it kind of looks like I'm being interviewed there, doesn't it? So the first thing, actually, believe it or not, even before opening ceremonies, they actually have ice skating. They'll do figure skating. And it's competitive. It's not like an exhibition. So they actually have a sport before opening ceremonies every Olympics. So I actually went that morning um, at 10 in the morning and photographed it. And it was, amazingly enough, I had my uh, think tank backpack, this one, uh, the rolling backpack on me, and I was kind of stepping through the road to get in and fell. I, my feet caught one of the ethernet wires and I fell over to the front row and damaged my hand and wrenched my back. I've never told anybody this yet. Um, it was really embarrassing and I thought, great, first event and I'm already hurt. Um, and so I popped Motrin for about three days and I, I, I did get better. But I thought, holy cow, that is not the way to start. Luckily, I didn't do any major damage, but that was literally how I started this Olympic Games. But I still got there and shot, um, and at that, that I actually shot with a 100 to 400. I love that lens, it's super sharp. It's also nice and small. It's not like carrying the 200 to 400 in. So it's kind of fun just to use that lens. So I'm looking for cool moments. Uh, I love it when I can get reflections like this and they're really low. And of course the cool thing about this is you get a little bit of the action, but you can't, you can't fake that. She, he can't just hold her in that position like that. And they're spinning around, so each time they'd come around, I'd fire off at 14 frames a second to get that shot. And then after getting a bunch of shots and doing shots like this a lot, then I started slowing down the shutter. So I could kind of pan with the athletes, try to get their faces sharp, but get motion in the background behind them. Otherwise, you could see the TV camera people there, and if they're sharp, your eye tends to go to them too, and I don't want that. Keeping with that same theme, I'm slowing it down even more, maybe going to 40th of a second. And I love the shot because his face is frozen, which is what I'm going for. She is showing the motion of her spinning and you can see the motion in his arms as he threw her and is getting ready to catch her. And again, this is something different. And so uh, as a photographer, this is, it doesn't matter what I'm shooting, whether it's the Olympics or a bar mitzvah wedding, birthday party, I don't care. I want to try to shoot it differently. And so for me, this is fun because it shows kind of more of the motion and action of the athletes. Okay. So this story, uh, how many people here read the blog? Cool, good. So I was blogging every day from the Olympics, uh, and those of you who read it may have seen this. It was by far my worst day at any Olympics. So you'll see that green sleeve that's on, actually I found this on my way here. I don't know why it's still in my bag, but I have the green sleeve with me. This is one of them. This is my replacement one, I think. Yes, 831 was my first. This is the green sleeve. So we actually have to wear these, and when we have these on our arm, this signifies us as a photographer. So everybody's got Olympic credentials on, even if you worked at the McDonald's on the Olympic Plaza, you have a credential. So they can't tell who does what. So we wear these, and that way they can look from a distance and say, yeah, 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 they can all be up front and shooting. But you have to have this or you don't shoot. So, uh, my roommate, who I just, I had shared a, an apartment with two other US people, writers, media, and one guy locked his key, the first day he locked his key in his room. And he said, can I borrow yours? Well, I lent him my keys, which also were on my credential and had my green sleeve. So I just handed it to him and said, no problem, go downstairs, get another one. He went outside to the tent where we checked in, he got a new key, came back, he goes, got it, thanks. I go, where's my green sleeve? And he goes, I don't know. I said, I need that sleeve, and I started freaking out. And um, 
uh, he, he went out in his shorts, 10 degrees, and looked all over for it, couldn't find it. I said, okay, it's no big deal. I'll just go back up another hour bus ride up to the press center. I'll get another green sleeve. So I went up to the uh, press center and I said to them, I need a new sleeve. And she says, yeah, that's great. Um, you have to go downtown to the police station and do a police report of it being missing. And I was like, now I was freaking out because she showed me her phone and says, here's where the police station is. Now, for those of us who don't read Korean, I was like, I said to her, that tells me nothing. Luckily, I saw at the bottom there is the Olympic Stadium where opening ceremonies was a couple days before, and I remember where the press, where the bus dropped us off. So I said, fine, I'll go there. So three hours later, I went to the police station and back. Actually, the police spoke no English. So we were using Google Translate on our phones back and forth between us. Because if you try to explain to a police officer, I'm missing a sleeve, that does not translate in any language. Um, and so they were helpful, they were amazing. Uh, I was editing my opening ceremonies pictures as I was there waiting for them to write the report. They were looking over my shoulder, enjoying the pictures. I said, if you help me out quickly, I will give you some of these pictures. Um, they said, we'll drive you back in our police car. So it was great. So they drove me back to the press center. I was FaceTiming with my wife saying, don't worry. I think it's all cleared, we're good. I get to the press center and I said to them, here's my police report, can I get my new green sleeve? And the woman said to me, we'll get back to you in 24 hours. Mm. Now I'm freaking out, because 24 hours of the Olympics is like an eternity. And I said to her, does that mean I can't shoot for a day? And she's, yes. Well, I had think commitments I had to do. The one I had that day was I had to be back to do the men's team picture on the ice. So all this is compressed and so, um, I literally made it, as the, half the guys were set up in chairs, I was walking into the arena. I literally cut it by about two minutes, kind of like showing up here today. It was that close to get the team picture. But um, this is Shi Jin, the woman on the uh, left there who helped me. She was unbelievable. She did give me a new green sleeve. That was it. That was her showing it to me. I do have it for you. I said, stop, let me get a picture. Um, she gave me her cell phone number and we were texting till like midnight that night. And she says, don't worry, I pulled some strings. We will have it for you in the morning so I could at least sleep because I wouldn't have slept well otherwise. Um, the Korean people, I will tell you, were unbelievable. By far the, the most helpful people at any Olympics I've ever been to. They would bend over backwards to help us out. And really, um, my biggest impression from this Olympics was you know, the police driving me back. Um, I was at one of the venues shooting uh, when there was no sport going on, because I was doing some pictures for the architects that built it, and um, couldn't find my way back. So here's a bus, like the size of a Greyhound bus, and the driver says, uh, come on in and I'll just drive you. And the guy drove me like five miles out of his way, just me, on this bus to get me back. I mean, the people were amazing. So anyway, I got the green sleeve back, uh, back in business, which is good. That's me holding both of them, because eventually, four days later, they did find the other one. And so uh, I do have both in my possession today, which is good. Now, after all this was said and done, it was really nice to actually have a hockey game, because it gave me, that's what I was there for, I wanted to get started. So this is the US team, the women, the women always start hockey about a week before the men do. This is the first women's game. We do shoot through plexiglass. So when I shoot for uh, hockey, NHL hockey here in the US, we're shooting through a hole in the glass, not the case. So we have these beautiful cameras and beautiful lenses and we're shooting through really bad plexi. So, um, although if you look at this picture here, you'll see the plexiglass was amazingly clean. I even sent out a social media post from my first game saying, this is the cleanest plexiglass I've ever seen in my life. It did get really scuffed up by the end of the games, but at the beginning it was beautiful. So I was able to shoot at about maybe a 30 degree angle with no problem. This is shot through the plexi like you see in the background there with the TV cameraman, straight through. Um, this is kind of my gear for shooting hockey. Um, I had two 1DX Mark IIs, or sometimes I brought the, the Mark IV, but generally I'd have two 1DX Mark IIs, one with the 70-200, that's my lens for shooting hockey. Um, and I'm generally shooting around F3.5 or F4. And the reason I'm doing that is because it gives me a little bit more in focus with my offensive player and a defensive player. So I, I want a little bit more in focus when I'm doing it. Then I have the other camera with a fisheye lens, and what I'll do is I'll pre-focus that to about a foot and a half, 
that's also laying next to me, just like opening ceremonies. And when the when the hockey players smash against the glass right in front of me, well, 7200 is not going to focus a foot away. So I'll reach down, I'll grab the fisheye, and I just spray and pray. I'm just holding down the button and hoping I get some good images out of it. One of the things I did in Sochi that I had never done before is I got some rubber hoods from here at B&H, 10 bucks. Is there anything in the photo industry that sells for $10? No. No, right? 10 bucks for a rubber hood, and it gives me about a quarter inch of give. So I could go up against the plexiglass and feel it, which helped me know that I was right against it, which is really helpful. Um, it also protected me a bit. So if someone gets slammed in the glass, I got about a quarter inch gift before it slams in my face. And we had numerous photographers at the Olympics that literally would cut their heads open. Because if you're up against a glass and, and someone gets checked into the boards, that thing will be bashing in. And we had a guy in San Jose at the Sharks game who literally broke every bone in his face, orbital, nose, everything. So you want to be careful. So $10 hood was a really good investment. Um, I also uh, was using, and didn't tell anybody I was using, but I was using ProGrade digital memory cards, which are um, a spin off all the top executives left Lexar when Micron got rid of Lexar, and left and started this new company. And uh, so I was using their cards, testing them at the Olympics, and now that's all the cards I'm using. So I should also mention the one thing I didn't put in here that I was using is a seat cushion. So one of the things I've learned in the last couple Olympics is we're sitting on either metal or plywood a lot of times. We're not in comfortable seats like the spectators. So I got one of those inflatable um, little cushions that you could blow up and then sit on, and that was a godsend. It was great to have that. Anyway, this, this is why I use a 70 to 200 on the glass. This is at 70. So when, when there's excitement and things going on, I can quickly roll out and get this kind of shot showing the celebration, but I can also go in tight to get shots like this, high action, peak of you know, the action in this case. This, I play ice hockey, I can't even, when I'm falling, I'm more concerned about getting hurt, let alone trying to get to the puck. Look at the concentration on her face. She's still going to make a play. That still blows my mind. But I was really excited to get this sharp and in focus. So again, I'm IO servo, center point, and actually in hockey, I was using the, the center point with the um, all the adjacent points as well, and I'm back button focusing as I'm shooting. <clears throat> Question, what's the shutter speed that you use with the 3.5? Yep, so, um, and, and it, we'll hold the questions to the end, okay. but I will answer that one because it was a good one. So the question was, what shutter speed am I shooting this at? When I'm shooting sports and I want to freeze the action, I like to be at least a thousandth of a second. I will tell you my settings for this ISO 1600, very good lighting at the Olympics. So ISO 1600, F3.5 or F4, generally at 1250th of a second. That was my settings. Um, the white balance is so good on the Canon cameras, auto white balance worked fine. Never messed with it. Now, I'm looking as a photographer to tell a story. That is our job. Regardless of whether we're shooting the Olympics or shooting a personal event or just shooting senior portraits, whatever. Our job is to tell a story of who that person is or who the team is. So I'm looking for the story. And here, you know, they scored, but I also had two of the Russian athletes kind of bookmarking them, or you know, at the, or, you know, bookends, if you will, at the end, with them in the middle. And I like that and framed it to shoot it that way. But I'm also looking for cool action. Um, this is a, a little scrum between the Americans and the Canadians who just love each other so much. I love it because the goaltender had her uh, helmet off and was going for a punch on one of the Lamoureux twins. I thought that was classic. So I had to get that shot. And this is what 1,250 of a second will do. You want to freeze the action. And again, by shooting not at 2.8, but giving myself a little bit of leniency at 3.5 or F4, I can get both of those skaters in the front in focus, but still have separation between them and the background. Now, I should mention that when I'm shooting hockey, I like to have the puck in the frame, unless it's the fight. I'm looking for that. But I shot a lot of other things at the Olympics. I'm shooting not only hockey. When there's no hockey game going on, I'll go shoot other things. So um, the long track speed skating, uh, I went to a point where I was on a turn because I wanted the lines to take you into the frame. That's part of my composition. And I also knew that come around a turn that they'd be in this stance. They'd be doing a crossover. So I positioned myself there and shot this with the 100 to 400. Same thing, you know, about a thousandth of a second. 
The thing about shooting uh, things like long track speed skating or short track speed skating is that after they go by, you've seen athletes come around and around and around and around, and you get the shot of things like what we saw before on this shot. After about 20 minutes, that becomes kind of mundane unless I'm shooting for a client. If I have a client who says, you know, if it's Fila and they're wearing a Fila outfit and they want that shot, I better get a nice clean shot for them. But if I'm just trying to get some nice shots for a portfolio, I wanna slow things down and do it differently. So I do that because I'm very ADD and I wanna create something different for myself and I don't wanna sit there for two hours shooting the same thing over and over. So I wanna show the motion of the athletes. I wanna pan along with them. And so motion panning is a lot like playing golf where you kind of start and you do the, the follow through on the swing. So I'll fo follow the athlete as they're coming around if it's uh, speed skating, I'm following them, bup, 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 and they're coming around bup, 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 this way. And I'm kind of using my hips. The weird thing at the Olympics was for speed skating, I was in a seat. Normally I shoot motion panning, I'm standing. So it's kind of weird for me to have to kind of pan while sitting. It took a little different technique for me. I got it, but it took a little longer. Um, I actually prefer to shoot my stuff handheld when I do motion panning. A lot of people think that I'm using a monopod. I actually, as much as I love my Getzel monopod, I actually prefer to shoot it handheld. It gives me more ability to reframe and follow them without having to worry about where I am, you know, do I have to re move the tip of the monopod, you know, in between. Um, now, shutter speed needs to be based on how fast, people always ask me, what's your shutter speed? I said, well, how fast is my subject? Right? If I've got a speed skater right in front of me and they're flying, I may need to be at 80th of a second to pan them. Now, if I've got a speed skater who's going slow because it's you know 50 lap race and they're on the other side of the arena, I might be able to pan them at 10th of a second to get what I want. So really, you have to think about that as you're shooting to get what you want. And one of my favorite shots that I got was at 40th of a second, and this is one of the speed skaters. But what, what happens when I'm panning, I've got her face perfectly sharp, but you see the motion in the hands, you see the arms, you see the feet, all of that motion's there. And all of my background and distractions is now no longer a distraction. It adds to the frame because everything's blurred and takes you right to the athlete. And the other thing is it's hard to do. So as a photographer, I mean, I wish I could tell you that every shot I take comes out. It doesn't. When you're doing motion panning, some work and some don't. And it's not just me as a photographer. I might be panning at the perfect speed with them, but they might be moving their head or their feet might be in the wrong position. So sometimes things every I just work out perfectly. I pan even things like curling, because curling is a fairly slow sport. So I'd be at 20th of a second. Here I'm panning with the guy. I like the fact that there's the Olympic rings tattooed on his arm. So I'm literally focused on his arm as I'm panning with him. You can see, because you look at the stone and there's motion in the stone. Here, I'm panning with the stone. This is the Americans that won gold. So I'm panning with the stone and I'm getting motion with him releasing it, but you'll see there's still motion in the people that are with him. And if you look at the logo in the background, it's blurred. Same thing here, the only difference here is I decided, just for the fun of it, to angle the camera to give it a little different action or look. I do this a lot when I'm shooting race cars. I'll tilt the camera because it adds a different dimension to the shot. Now I didn't do it here, thank goodness. Um, if I'm capturing actions and reactions, I like to get it fast, but um, I should mention that my first Olympics ever shot, when, I, when someone scored a goal, I'd look down at the camera to see what I got. And I learned quickly that was a bad idea because you want to capture action and reaction. And so this to me is actually even more exciting than the shot itself, which is why it's in this presentation to show you. But I love it when they celebrate toward me. It's very nice of them. Because I have to pick what side of the rink I'm gonna be on. I can sit almost anywhere. So it's always good when the action happens around me. One of my favorite pictures of the Olympics is this one, <laughs> uh, because it's so unique. <clears throat> I've played hockey for 17 years, never seen this, and I've watched a lot of hockey. This uh, ref, he started by kind of being by the net, and then as the scrum was going on, he couldn't tell if the puck was going to cross the line or not. This guy literally suspended himself up on the net to look. That's dedication. And it's such a cool shot. As I shot this, I thought that better be sharp. Um, and I took this picture, and I love it, not only because of the ref and the way he is, but look at the mayhem that's going on in front of him. 
And so I took this picture, and um, about a month before the Olympics, one of the uh, refs, the female refs from the US, uh, her friend follows my blog. And so he put her in contact with me and she said, look, I'm gonna be refing the games in the Olympics. I'm really excited. It's a huge honor. I won't be doing any US games because I'm from the US. But if you can get some pictures of me, that'd be great. So I had her email and her cell phone number and I texted her and said, well, do you know what games you're refing? And I eventually did shoot them for her. Then I got this picture and I texted her and I sent her this picture on text and I said, do you know the, the male referees as well? Because I want him to have this picture. And she says, yeah, that's Tobias. And uh, we're laughing at the picture right now. So she was with him. And so I got his email address and I sent it to him. And he's actually a banker, uh, I think he's in Budapest, if I remember correctly. And um, no, Lichtenstein, sorry. Um, and that his full-time job is as a banker. And so they're doing a story on him and he emailed me and said, can we use the picture for the story? I'm like, absolutely. So you should print it and frame it and put it in your office, which I think it is. Um, but it's really cool to actually get a personal interaction with this guy just from having the picture. One of the other advantages of being a photographer for the team is I get to know the guys and the ladies. So it's fun uh, during warm-ups and things that they recognize me. I'm not just another one of those photographers. They don't look at me as media. I'm part of the team, which is really exciting and fun. So and especially playing hockey. So I look up to these guys. I'd you know, love to be out there with them, but I'm not near good enough. Um, but it's fun when they see me on the glass and they'll either give me a smile or sometimes they'll flick the puck right at my lens or whatever just to have fun. Luckily, there's glass in between us. But it's cool to have that rapport with them. Fun moments like this where the goaltender's smashing one of our players into the net behind him. One of the cool things about 14 frames per second is I could animate this whole sequence of him going into the net. It was pretty funny. Um, toward the end of the uh, men's Olympic run, uh, I did say them we've yet to do locker room shots. So, um, and this is an area where photographers are not allowed, so we usually have to sneak, they usually try to sneak me in to get me in there, and it never failed yet so far. This, the equipment manager will set up everything so I can get the shots, and my job is to get some nice shots in the locker room. But this was a, um, an interesting Olympics that the, the general manager of the both teams, of USA Hockey, um, Jimmy Johansson, passed away about a week before the Olympics, or two weeks before, it was horrible. And he was literally instrumental in who was playing. He was like a father to, to the athletes. Um, and it was an unexpected, horrible thing that happened. And so they set up a locker just for him. Below, they had a binder of you know, his accomplishments and letters to the guys. They had the flags that you see up there, and they had a jersey made for him, and that was poignant. And so my job, again, as a photographer, is to make darn sure that I had this photo, which is in uh, the USA Hockey Magazine. And so, again, going back to what we do as photographers, we tell a story. I love shooting things. People always ask me, what do you like to shoot at the Olympics? Anything new? We don't have a whole lot of ski jumping in San Francisco. <laughs> so, um, actually, we don't have snow either. So, But um, it was really fun to do. And uh, if you look closely, you'll see the Olympic rings that are on the snow below them reflecting in the goggles, which I thought was really cool. So I went up there one night and just shot practice. Uh, and then I also moved to different positions. It was a very unique ski jump, the building in the background with the lighting. So I moved, even though I started at the top of the jump, I walked all the way down the steps on the side to a position where I could get the ski jumper with the Alpensia ski jump in the background. You'll notice I also framed it to get the Olympic rings in the shot, which is critical because where are we? We're at the Olympics. So I try to put those rings in as much as I can. Okay, people ask me if I ever plan a shot, so I added this for you. This is how I plan one photo. Before I went to ski jumping, uh, I knew the location, I knew where I wanted to be, and I kind of figured the shot I wanted, and I kind of figured out probably be from that bottom of the hill. I knew I wanted to be head on, and I wanted the Olympic rings in the shot. I brought a Canon 1DX Mark II, and I did bring the 200, 400. Afterwards, I kind of cursed myself. I wish I brought like a 70, 200, 100, 400. But I had the big lens. I, I wanted IO servo, and I wanted a super slow shutter shot of ski jumping, which I really never done in, in a shot like this. 
So I went to the bottom of the slope. I went to about 50th of a second. Now I'm hand holding a 1DX Mark II and a 200 400, which combined weighs probably about, I don't know, 18 pounds or something. It's heavy. My back was screaming at me because about 45 minutes later, I'm still trying to get this picture. Um, and again, no monopod. So I'm holding this thing. Now, what I wanted was the jumper panned over the rings. If you look at this shot, they're not quite over the rings. And if I were to zoom in, you'd see that there's nothing sharp about this. Most of the images I took, because I'm at 40th of a second at 560 millimeters, most of the shots were not sharp. It was like this. And then I got some that were sharp, but he's past the rings. So I kept going and going and going until I got that shot. That's at 40th of a second, 560 millimeters, right over the rings. And it took me about 45 minutes to get one picture. But I like that picture, something different. And also, uh, I went to uh, biathlon. I'd never photographed biathlon before. Something new, something different. So I got there a little bit early. I walked around the facility. Okay, where's the starting? This is the start. Okay, I know an angle to get that shot. Where's the shooting? Where's the finish line? So I'm looking at that and, and th figuring what colors I might be able to get in the shot. So I positioned myself for the for this shot as they took off, but I also knew that I could shoot this. I could also turn to the left and move only about 25 feet and get this shot. Now, why did I shoot from here? I shot from here because I had an S curve going through the frame. So it kind of takes your eye curving through the image. And then I waited for the lead pack to go by this is on the second lap. There's a little bit more separation. So the lead pack's there, and these other guys were all coming behind to fill the frame. Because otherwise, if I have empty at the top or empty at the bottom, it's not as interesting. So part of it's luck, too. But I waited and shot from that position to do that. Then, once they'd gone by and I got these shots, I ran all the way around and underneath, and I went to the other side where they were shooting, because I really wanted this shot with them concentrating and shooting, and I wanted the shell expelling from the camera. So again, this is where 1DX Mark II at 14 frames a second makes all the difference in the world. I'm watching his finger, and as he's pulling the trigger, I'm pulling the trigger. So I'm firing off my shots. There were a couple times where he would go like this and start squeezing and he wouldn't shoot, and I'd like, I'm like, come on, shoot. But eventually, I got the shot. Then I ran back for the finish and luckily got there in time. Because for being my only biathlon, it was an unbelievable race where the Frenchman won literally by the size of his shoe. So I thought they went by the tip of the ski. They don't. It actually goes by the tip of your boot. So I'm firing off at 14 frames a second as they're coming in for the end. And if you look, the Frenchman is just crossing in front of the other guy. They said that his foot's a lot bigger. If the other guy had a bigger foot, he may have tied or won. It was that close. So again, for me, it was exciting to be able to capture that in a frame. So then it was back to ice hockey, and um, I was shooting, I always shoot before the game starts, just to make sure my camera settings are right and everything's good. So I'll pre-frame frame a couple shots just to make sure that exposure looks good and everything else. Well, I shot this because I thought it was funny that this uh, referee was looking underneath the net. And when I got home that night, I thought, oh, that's like a meme. It needs something for social media. And I thought, wait a second, I could have some fun with this. So I dropped in my green sleeve <laughs> and I said, oh, that's where it is. <laughs> and so, um, and if you look closely, I actually not only, so what I did was I took my, my green sleeve uh, in my room, in my apartment, I put it on a white towel in my bathroom, so I had white underneath it, and shot picture, then resized it way down, and I added a drop shadow to, to make it even look more realistic, but that was pretty fun, and I actually put that on social media, and everybody loved it, so me having fun. Then it's actually back to shooting the real game. This is the US uh, woman uh, versus Finland, and really for the women's hockey, we didn't think the men would do that great because the NHL didn't send any players, so we had a bunch of collegiate players and, and all amateurs versus Russia and Finland and all these teams in Sweden who had all pros. But the woman we knew was gonna come down to US versus Canada, almost for sure. So this is in the game before the finals, we played Finland, and we were up by four or five goals in the third period. So I thought, now what? So I got this shot with a puck right on the goal line going in. And I thought, okay, well, now we're up by five goals. Well, how am I going to do this? So just for the fun of it, I motion panned hockey. I've never done that before. Through plexiglass, no less. 
Um, so this is a 7200. Uh, um, and you can tell who I'm focused on because she's in focus and no one else is. So I'm focusing right dead center and panning with her. So this Olympics was like my motion pan Olympics. I was panning everything. Um, again, angling the camera a little differently here. This is the long track speed skating. Again, my goal is to kind of get their face frozen. You can tell I'm focusing on the person in the middle because they're sharp, but I'm getting great motion in their arms and legs. So much more it's hard to shoot, but so much more rewarding to get when you get it right. I even shot through stuff, which I usually don't do, because in the middle is where all the athletes are warming up. So they're running, stretching, you've got coaches, you've got timers, you've got other photographers and TV cameras and God knows what. So I'm trying to focus with them as they're going through all that mess of people. And I kind of liked it. It was something different. The challenge with motion panning bobsled is that they're really fast. So I told you before, I like to shoot sports at about a thousandth of a second. You cannot do that with bobsled. They're going so fast that I was up at six thousandth, eight thousandth of a second to freeze them. So I got some shots, which I'll show you, but then I wanted to motion pan them. The challenge with motion panning bobsled is that even if I'm perfectly at the right speed, I have another challenge, and that is the vibration of the sleds. They're going so fast that they're moving. So that creates an extra challenge in getting the shot. But see all the people in this, I don't want them to be sharp. I want them to be blurred because I want your eye to go to the sled. Not that I didn't freeze it. Again, I did bring that Canon 8 to 15 fish eye lens, and it's cool. You can tell I'm literally right on the railing, right in front of this. These guys are probably at this point maybe about five feet from me as I'm shooting. I did this on the only turn, turn 15, was the only turn that had the Olympic logo and the rings. So that's where I went to do most of my shooting. Uh, when I got home, I shot some skeleton as well. When I got home, I realized that when I was looking through these, that 14 frames a second happened to be just perfect for this. No overlap at all in all the frames. So I composited each of these into separate layers in Photoshop and combined them. And that's actually the lead picture on my webpage right now. Now, what's interesting about this, you'll notice I hopped the gate. I'm actually on the ice shooting this. I'm about two feet from them when they go by me. You can feel the wind as they're cruising by you. I composited a couple others just for the fun of it. Now, one of the cool things about shooting the Olympics is I have really fun access like this, where I was on the Today Show set shooting, and this is Hoda with the men's team. So the men lost their game, but they invited them all onto the show, so I went with the team, and it was kind of fun to watch them uh, with some of the figure skaters there, or the ice dancers. The highlight of my Olympic Games. Um, I went to the Olympics, to this Olympics, and everybody, uh, all my friends and family knew that I only wanted one thing. I wanted to see the woman win gold. And the reason was, in shooting in Vancouver and in uh, Sochi, the woman lost to Canada. But Sochi was painful because the women were up by two goals with a couple minutes left in the game. I had already switched lenses like, okay, we got this. I'm shooting on the ice, I'm shooting gold medal. And then the Canadians scored. Then they pulled their goalie and scored again. Then we went to overtime and they scored a third time. And seriously, and I've told this story here before, it was like watching someone die. It was seriously the most depressing thing to watch other than death. And um, the women didn't even speak for days when I'd see them. They were so distraught about losing. And the thing with a gold medal game is this. You don't win a gold medal or you don't win a silver medal Right, you lost a gold medal. So if you're in the bronze medal game, you either get a bronze medal or you get nothing. So if you win bronze, you're thrilled. In the, in the gold medal match, they want gold. So what I said when I got, before I left, is the only thing I really want is the woman to beat Canada in the gold medal game. And of course, in the prelims against Canada, a week before the gold medal game, we lost to Canada. So the team, um, before each game, would text me and say, here's what we're looking for. So in this particular case, they, uh, they said to me, uh, what we really want is something that shows the intensity of this game. And so um, 
I happened to sneak into a position I wasn't supposed to be in where they're coming out of the tunnel and I saw the goaltender and she's got her eyes down and she's looking really intense. So I quickly shot that, did a quick edit, emailed it up to the Trib uh, Tribune area, which is up above in the stands, to the person who's doing social media for the team and they said, that's the shot we wanted. Hold on two seconds. Have another jacket. Okay, she's cold. Um, and then the game started. You can barely see it, but the puck is right in the middle of the frame, right there. So I'm looking for those types of shots. Um, the funny thing is I got to the arena probably, well, I got there at 10 a.m. to do their locker room pictures. This game was at 1.15. Uh, I didn't get out of there until nine o'clock at night, and then we went to the Today Show, it was a long day. But I got there really early to find clean plexiglass. The nice thing was they had repolished all the glass before the gold medal match. So it was, it was back to being very clean and very shootable. There was a point at the Olympics where I could not achieve focus with my camera at all. And I was so frustrated. It was like, er, 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 er. I mean, because the glass was so bad that it was having a hard time getting focal point. But the game was great. Um, U.S. was behind Canada for most of the game by a goal. A um, lot of action. This is uh, Brianna Decker getting decked. Um, I thought this should have been a penalty. They didn't call it. But again, I'm looking for those points of that, that key action. And then um, in the third period, one of the La Moreau twins, Monique, scored the tying goal. I got this shot of her celebrating and I texted my contact at the team and I said, I have your cover shot for USA Hockey Magazine. Um, I really thought this was gonna be it. Regardless of what happened in the game, I thought that was my cover shot. Well, then she tied the game, it went to overtime. Overtime, the whole period, nobody scored and it went to shootout. Her twin sister went and shot and made a beautiful move around the goaltender, and this was the game-winning goal. Um, thankfully, I was on the right side of the uh, gla on the right side of the rink to get this shot because if I'm on the opposite side, you're just going to see the back of the goaltender and you're not going to see the puck. But as it is, I have the whole sequence of her doing this, and the, you see the puck right there. And if you look closely at the goaltender's face, you can see the the ugh. I'm not going to get this. Um, that was a critical moment, and of course, thankfully, she turned around right toward me, and she celebrated that way. Um, and I was happy to get that shot with a goaltender in the background. Um, I turned, uh, then they had to wait for a Canadian player to try to score. She didn't, the goaltender stopped it, and then they went crazy. Now I'm shooting through Plexi, but I also know that I have access now as the team photographer to get on the ice to actually shoot without plexiglass, but at what point do I move? Because I don't want to miss this. So I'm shooting through plexi, and the whole time I'm shooting like, now when do I move, when do I move? And eventually I, I jammed over to the other side of the rink um, through the penalty box door and, and went in and shot on the ice. I'm not sure who was more excited, them or me. Um, it really was everything I wanted. It was an unbelievable game. The girls were beyond ecstatic. Um, and for me to get shots like this, and they all knew that I was their photographer, so I had command of them, which was great. They'd look at me and not everybody else, which is cool. And I could even suggest stuff. But getting reactions like this, a little bit of crying and just disbelief is what we live for. Getting them getting their gold medals, I love this shot for a lot of reasons. One, because they won gold, just the reactions on their faces, and behind them a lot of the family members and actually a couple friends of mine who were there uh, are in this shot. Now, at the same time, I did see this. And as a photographer, it's very hard to shoot this because part of me says, no, don't go there. It's like when I shot a funeral one time for a 13-year-old kid and all of her friends were crying. It was the hardest thing I ever shot. And I'm like, do I turn? Do I shoot all of her friends crying or not? And I did, because it was part of the story. I'm kind of glad I did, but I felt like I was invading their privacy. And this is one of those moments like, do I turn and get the shot? But I felt it was important for two reasons. One is it shows that even though they won a silver medal, this is the way they felt. And the other thing is, it's the exact same reaction the US had four years before, and I remember living that. 
And um, what I did not know at the time, I posted this uh, blog on the internet or on social media, on Facebook and Instagram and all that and Twitter. And uh, people were commenting saying, we're from Canada and we're embarrassed by our, our athletes. Now, at the time I said, well, no, this is a natural reaction. We did the same thing four years ago. What I did not know is at the time, I didn't know that some of the Canadian players had taken the medal off immediately which is bad. I thought that was really disrespectful and out of place. But it is, you know, it was tough for them, especially losing in overtime like that. But of course, we were loving it. So the, the girls were having a great time. I was, it was funny because as their team photographer, I'm trying to shoot and get the shots for them and I'm high-fiving them and like, yeah, like with them the whole time. It was just, uh, it was a celebration. And then, unfortunately, all of their families were on the other side. So then they all skated over to, to do iPhone pictures with their family. And I'm saying like, get over here, let me get portraits of you guys. So I could grab as many of them as I could to get pictures for them, not only for, for the team, but I wanted them to have nice pictures for them to have. So this shot here is um, uh, on the right side of the frame is Hillary Knight, uh, who had a great games, um, and I'll tell you uh, about that gold medal in a second. This is Kendall Coyne with her fiance, who actually used to play in the NFL, so he's a strong guy, so he could lift her up like that. But I saw that moment, and I was like, oh, I got to capture that. Now this is probably 15, 20 minutes after the gold medal celebration. They were on the ice until they turned the lights out. <laughs> they were out there forever. Um, but I actually said, I saw the gold medals and, and we were on the ice. So one of the other photographers said to me, wait, let me get a picture of you. And I go, hold on a second. I, I, and I said to Hillary, I, Hillary, can I borrow your gold medal? And so uh, I did and she let me wear it. And I got my picture, which is really cool. Um, but as I put her gold medal on, this I don't know who this guy was, I don't know if it's security or whatever, some American guy, he runs over to me and he was livid. He's like, get that back to her now. And I was like, so in the pictures, you get, one of the pictures is me smiling. And one of me is like freaking out, like what do I do? And um, and then Hillary skated over and said, no, 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 he's our photographer, he's friends, we're good. And then he, the guy came over to me like 10 minutes later and apologized, he goes, like, sorry, I, th I thought you were a regular photographer. And I'm like, well, I am a regular photographer. I just happen to be their photographer. But it was kind of funny that uh, the guy, I, I guess they have people there to guard, I never thought about it, to guard to make sure that people don't take their medals or something. But it was cool to get that shot. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned, I got there at 10 in the morning. Uh, I ended up, because it went to overtime, double overtime, and shootout, and then they were on the ice for an hour. Uh, we were, and then I had to edit all the pictures because the whole time I'm shooting the elation and celebration and portraits, the team is texting me going, we need the gold medal picture of all the girls getting their gold medal. So I'm like, well, do you want me to stop? And they go, no, no, don't stop. Just keep shooting, but we need it right away. So then I went back and I edited um, till right before the Today Show, literally made it for about, about five minutes to spare running over. This was right outside the hockey venue, thankfully. Um, and they were on the Today Show. And then at one point I said to Hoda and these guys, hey, can I get a shot of you with the girls? And they go, yeah. So I just got in front of the cameras. This is what during a commercial break or whatever. And I stood there and shot this. And it's funny because I shoot a lot of bar mitzvahs and I'm used to telling the kids, everybody hands up. And so I did that with them. I'm like, okay, what the heck? I'll just see if I can get them to do it. And, and that was the shot we got. And then um, after the next day, there was another press conference uh, about them winning gold. And uh, Canon CPS is awesome. They're, they're there at the Olympics with gear for us to borrow. And um, you know if we drop something and break it, they'll fix it. But they also have a wide format printer that they bring. So I asked Canon literally about a half hour before this press conference, can you crank out a couple, couple of enlargements for me? So they did the team picture and they did a big portrait of Hillary. I figured she was nice enough to let me borrow her gold medal. I should get a picture for her. So I did like three prints. And I thought it would be kind of fun to get them, having a picture of them holding one the next day, so I gave that to them. And then just a couple weeks ago, uh, the magazine came out, and there is the shot that I took of Jocelyn Lamoureux celebrating after that, she got that shootout goal. And I will tell you that um, as a photographer who's had covers before of different magazines, there's nothing better than seeing your image used on a cover. Um, and the way that they did it, I thought was great, the way that they, they used the image. Um, and uh, 
the whole inside is like covered with images that I took. So as a photographer, it's not a bragging rights thing, it's just that we want to see our images used. Like it's weird to shoot, and I don't know if you guys shoot professionally, but if you've ever shot an event and then like nothing gets used or they use one photo, there's people here going, yeah, like that sucks. Like use the stuff. So it's really great uh, when I got the magazine to be able to see all of the images, you know, some of my favorite stuff being used. Um, it's just gratifying. You know, my name is like about that big in there, but I don't care. I just want to know that it's being used. So then uh, I'm heading off for closing ceremonies. Now closing ceremonies and opening ceremonies are more theatrical, more geared to television, but still yield kind of cool shots for us. Um, and so I do like to go. Again, same thing here. I'm at minus one to protect the highlights of the flame in the background. Had some cool colors on the stage and shot this again with the 2470, um, more of a wide shot. And then when the US team came out, this time I was kind of prepared. They don't come out as teams, they kind of just come out in mass. But Lindsey Vaughn, who actually was at the Today Show at the same time as the girls were from the hockey team, so I got to talking to Lindsey and did some photos for her um, with her iPhone and some other stuff for her. And so I saw her come out on this guy's shoulders and I thought, that's too cool. And then she started cracking up like this. So I took this and uh, emailed all these to her uh, a couple weeks ago. It's such a great reaction. Perfect lighting too, I should mention, right on her. Sometimes we just get lucky. And then during that, I'm looking for interesting lighting and, and cool composition. Here I had a nice, you know, cool shape forming from where I was sitting with these light up panels. This is during the handover to Beijing for the next Winter Olympics. And so I framed it, and again, this is a small portion of the stage, but I framed it just to kind of get this to have it in the, in the image. And then facing me, these girls were holding these globes and um, like kind of snowballs, snow cubes, or what I call them, snow globes. And the light was perfect on their face. So quickly, I actually uh, went down even more in my exposure comp because I wanted to make sure that their faces were perfectly exposed without overdoing it or underdoing it. So I actually rolled down, I think, to minus two and then pulled it later on in Photoshop. I wanted to make sure I got the exposure on their faces correct. Everything else could go out. I don't care. So the last day of the Olympics, uh, this was, uh, again, closing. Closing is kind of a bittersweet moment for us. It's like it's part of its relief, like I survived another Olympics. And part of it is sad because it's coming to an end. Um, it is three long, long, long weeks. The next day, a couple of photographers who were not flying out that day, I flew out two days later, we all decided to go to the beach, go see the Olympic rings on the beach. Of course, the beach, we're not there in bathing suits, we're in big jackets because we're freezing. Um, and there are the Olympic rings, and you can see, if you look closely, there's people sitting on the rings to get their picture taken. Well, to me, I, A, I don't want to wait in line for my picture to be taken, and I'm too impatient. And B, it wasn't that good a shot. And so I thought, how can I take a picture here that's different? And so I found this girl who's standing here with these glasses on, and I said, can you come here for a second? And kind of moved her, and then I shot this picture. That's my jacket, you can see on the edge of the frame there. And then she wasn't smiling. I go, come on, give me a smile. And then I took a picture. And again, just like before with the athletes, I got her email address and I sent it to her. So here's the Olympics by the numbers. I was there in Pyeongchang for about 20 days. I walked 159 miles in those 20 days. So I was telling the guys at lunch today, I walked 10, uh, six to 10 miles a day. So, so far today, I'm probably not close yet, about three miles, um, but I like to walk and I do it because you have to be in shape if you're gonna you know, do the Olympics. I climbed 800 flights of stairs in those 20 days. A lot of that was things like ski jump or getting into positions in different places or up and down arenas. Um, I spent about 35 hours on buses and that was painful. Uh, way too long, a lot of wasted, not wasted time because I'm still editing or blogging, but it did mean that I couldn't hit as many of the events as I wanted to shoot. Um, I did 39 blog posts in 20 days. Um, and that's editing the photos and writing. And I do that because I love sharing the stories um, with everybody. The blog traffic goes somewhere between a quarter million and a half a million people during the Olympics. And it's great to get feedback. And for all of you who have sent me emails, thank you, because it, it makes me feel really good that people are reading it and enjoying it. Um, and so um, 
it took me on average about two hours per blog to write, and uh, average sleep, sleep at the Olympics maybe five and a half hours on a good day. Um, and by the way, the beds in Korea are not like beds in the U.S. They're about as soft as this podium. Um, one guy, one of the photographers showed up. He goes, oh, cool. Our box springs are here. I wonder when they're going to deliver the mattress. I go, that is your mattress. Um, so it was, it was not the easiest thing. You could not sleep on your side because it would hurt your hips too much. Um, but, uh, but we're also tired that I actually slept fine because I was exhausted. But typically, like I said, about 8 or 8.30 in the morning till about 2.30 or 3 in the morning every day. It was not unusual to have meetings or conference calls or text messages with Team USA at 1.30, 2 in the morning. Or sometimes we just meet down in the cafeteria or what they called the bar area, which is outside our building, at 1 in the morning and just talk about what we wanted to do the next day. I took around 48,000 images during the three weeks. Um, and uh, I retained about 17,000. Now, a lot of people would say, that's not a very good take rate. And the reason that my take rate was about a third of what I shot is because I was doing so much motion panning that a lot of the images were just soft or didn't come out or I didn't need them. Or in the case of ice hockey, where I'm slamming out 14 frames a second to get that peak of action, that means there's a lot of images that really weren't peak of action. I'll purge those every night because I'm trying to keep my drive, my SSD on this computer free in space for the next day's shooting. So I would purge a lot. About half a terabyte of data. The cool thing about that is I would back up to, I had portable SSDs that I have with me. I was also, I've got a Drobo A10N server at my house and I have remote access to it. So I was actually moving all my favorite edited photos from Korea right to my house so that they'd be safe. Um, I'm going to play for you. I should have told you we have audio, but I lied. I didn't tell you. But I do have a video here of some of my uh, favorite images, kind of a three-minute slideshow um, that was done in uh, Photodex Pro Show Web. Let me show you here.
Thank you. And just for those who ask, because everybody asks me, they used to always ask me, why aren't you doing photo tours? And I am doing them now. Uh, next one, which is coming up soon, is Namibia, which is already sold out. And Botswana, we do have a couple spots left for Botswana, which is gonna be awesome, both for uh, landscapes and, and wildlife. And Costa Rica in August, I think, I may have one spot, I'll, I'll open on that one, I'll have to look. And then we're doing Croatia, Slovenia, then we have two uh, trips to Tanzania, that's all on safari, um, January and February. And uh, February is still available for sure. And two more, Costa Rica, which is in the rainforest, which is crazy cool, really fun to shoot. And then we have the migration, the other direction, not reverse migration, but actual migration in August in Tanzania. And then we're doing India in uh, January of 2020 and February of 2020. So I, it's end of January, beginning of February. So um, if anybody's interested, just email me and I'll give you more information. Or you can just go to my website, it's on there as well. Speaking of which, uh, on the web, a couple things. Uh, the website is jeffcable.com, and uh, I do have a page that I built recently, which is jeffcable.com slash Jeff's Deals. I think that's under the About page, and you can get to Jeff's Deals. And that's all my sponsors like if, that, that have offered deals um, to get discounts on their products. I've been trying to negotiate more and more of those for all of you guys. Um, and then the blog is just blog.jeffcable.com. You can email me and I answer everybody. I mean, here, who's emailed me? Bunch of people. Have I answered all your emails? Say yes, good. I answer every email. So um, if you have a photo and you want me to critique it, I'll answer it. Um, just Jeff at jeffcable.com. Uh, Facebook and Instagram, just Jeff Cable Photography, all one word. And then Twitter, I don't know why, but it's, I just made jcable12. So. Weird, weird but true. Um, so for the live streaming, if anybody has questions uh, that's out there in that interweb, feel free to uh, just blast me an email or, or questions online or social media and I'll answer them. And then if you guys have questions, just come up and I'll stick around as long as I need to to answer them. How's that? And thank you so much, appreciate it. Hope you liked it.